What's up, everybody, and welcome to Lacrosse Now. Tom Eschen here in the studio bringing you everything you need to know, most importantly, about what's going on in the lacrosse world when it comes to what's going on in Ireland. They're at the U21 World Championships in Limerick, well underway. Travis is off here, so that's why he's missing. It's just me, and but you still get plenty of others. I brought along some friends here for today's show. You're going to get to know something on the inside of the past and the present of these U19, now U21 World Championships, including players currently playing in Ireland right now. Now, Puerto Rico, one of the darlings of the tournament. They are playing great. Just blew out Germany here today. We'll talk to Brandon Aviles and Colin Baez. Aviles of Syracuse, Baez of Jacksonville, as they continue to guide this squad, maybe into Group A. More on that later. We'll also talk to Sweden's Jonas Hunter. Jonas Hunter individually having one of the best games, one of the best few games here of his life over the course of this tournament for Team Sweden, now competing in the platinum bracket there as well. But we'll start with someone who's already been there and done that. Ryan Conrad, who won a gold medal, the game-winning goal in that gold medal game against Canada back in 2016. Also, of course, the PLL Water Dogs, national champion with the University of Virginia. We'll start there with Ryan Conrad. Here is my conversation with him now. All right, so Ryan Conrad does join us now. And Ryan, we'll get to some of the PLL stuff in a second, but right now we're in the midst of those uh, U21 World Championships. I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience back in 2016. Uh, of course, the heroics and everything. You look at it now, of course, as a U21 event. That was way back in 2016. That feel like forever ago now to you. You've gone through college, now a, a PLL career. What's it been like to, to kind of go through your lacrosse career since then? Yeah, I'll tell you that, you know, that experience was one of the, you know, the most meaningful to me that, that I've had in my entire life. Any chance you get to represent, you know, USA and put on the red, white, and blue is just something that you cherish forever. The moments that I was able to have and, you know, to, to cherish with, you know, the brothers on my team, I still remember it. And it really feels like it was yesterday. Now I can still remember that, you know, the end game with Canada, just being down by six, the feeling that we had uh, going into the kind of second half and everything, it, it was an incredible experience. And I think what ultimately kind of allowed us to be able to come back and have that, you know, great victory was just how close we were and how much time we spent together. And, you know, it's even more so for these guys with U21, they, they spent, you know, years with each other now, like we only had, a, you know, probably a year in total that we had tryouts and training camps before we went over. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I felt bad for these guys at first, uh, not being able to kind of, you know, go out there and kind of do what they wanted to do at U19. But, you know, it's actually a pretty cool experience that they get to represent uh, USA for, for call it now three years. Yeah, and it's cool to look, be able to look back on it now to see all the talent that was on that roster at the time. Obviously, this time around, we get a better idea with some of the guys already in college um, and doing a great job at that. For you, you know, kind of knowing back then and what you know now in terms of the, the group around you, did you have an idea of like, okay, you know, the, we're going to be the next kind of the generation of, of collegiate players in the next four years? Did you have that feel over the course of working with those guys up until those 2016 games? Yeah, I mean, I, I think where we really saw how good our players were going to be at the next level was when we had all the tryouts, we all went to college, hmm. and then we came back for training camps and for the ultimate games. We saw a pretty big step up in terms of the level and just granted the coaches that you know these kids were able to, to get when we were going into college that first year we took strides going from basically, you know, playing the hill and losing by 10 plus goals to then competing on the world stage against obviously Canada and all the best teams in the world. Hmm. So I think that's when we really saw how great these players were going to be. But, you know, I, I don't know if I could tell you that I thought Jared Bernhardt was going to be the tour Don winner, the best across player. And now, you know, <laughs> on the Atlanta Falcons and obviously he's an incredible athlete. <laughs> um, but he he is just uh, you know quite the player to watch. Yeah, uh, beyond that of your own team, you know, seeing other countries, and we see it, of course, this year. We saw it back in 2016. Is that it's got to be a different experience, a, a whole different kind of opponent, I'd imagine, to go and face, especially on a daily basis in a format like this. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I mean, playing against all the different countries is a really cool experience because you know a lot of them will kind of look to us and the USA and to Canada for, for frankly, a lot of their training and 
how they're learning. They're watching videos from either U.S. coaches or you know maybe they're watching highlights and just getting able to meet them and talk with them is really cool. But what I think is the coolest part about it is how much they're developing and becoming incredible lacrosse teams. Like it's not just like individual athletic, you know, players. They're really becoming pretty incredible across and i'll i'll tell you when we played japan in the the sixes you know a couple months ago they obviously took home the bronze we were you know astonished at how good they were we always knew that they were coming up but you know i'd say in the next couple of years there is going to be multiple different countries that are competing you know at an extremely high level which is awesome to see yeah we've had a few of the japan games here on lsn to see how disciplined they are but then you're like, these are athletes too, right? Like, these guys yeah. can play a little bit you know, at the same time. Yeah. They're not just uh, fundamentally correct. Now they've got some guys that can actually play um, really well and, and kind of match up a little bit better. Um, before we get, I wanted to ask you about the sixes in a second. Before we get to that, so the first game, second game thing, because, of course, you guys handled Canada pretty well in 2016, and then the second time around was a lot different. Of course, you needed to have that game-winning goal. What's the difference beginning of the tournament, end of the tournament? Now, how do things change over the course of the week or so you play each other? Yeah. Um, you know, what I'd say is the Canadian team is extremely well coached, mm -hmm. and there is an absolute effort from their end to not show everything they have in the first game. They and that's something that we know. That's something that you know we try and do as well. But I'd say they're an incredibly well coached team. They're an incredible, obviously incredible players as well. But they just brought a different intensity when it came to that second game. And I mean, we all know the the tale. It's hard to beat a team twice. Mm -hmm. um, what I think ultimately kind of drove that is they just jumped on us early. We were able to kind of you know take the first couple punches and and hang in there, and then ultimately come back at the end. But I think it really comes down to, you know, them just frankly being more prepared and wanting it in the first half more than we did. But then ultimately we were able to kind of band together and, you know, battle through the adversity and, and end up kind of getting getting the win at the end. So good advice for this year's team. You got to be ready for that first punch, especially as competitive as the first game was this time around, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to ask you about sixes playing in the world games. Um, obviously not the result you want. We talked to Tom Schreiber about that. He still didn't seem very, I mean, I imagine, not very pleased with not, of course, coming out on top in that event. But just yeah. on a grander scale here, your experience, this international competition at sixes, not in like a scrimmage format, not just a play, playing day format or training. What was it like, you know, to be out there competing for like a gold medal at the end of the day in this format? Yeah, it was really cool. And, you know, I, I was a part of kind of the full training camp, uh, you know, experience. I think we had three in total. And the one thing that I would say is we were just as not in the know as anyone else. We're still figuring out the rules. We were still trying to test out the format and see what kind of made sense. So when we got to the actual games, there was kind of a feeling out period. We we're all a little bit green when it kind of came to, you know, real competition and you know, the refs being able to actually do it, which, you know, at the end of the day, I think they did a great job um, doing it. But, you know, obviously not the outcome that we wanted, but in terms of format, in terms of expansion of the game, in terms of ability to potentially get into the Olympics, I don't think there is a better format for it. Um, you know, I would say the Sixes tournament did an incredible job of showing why this format should be what is taken to the next level. Like, look at Japan, look at Great Britain, look at Australia, who are extremely competitive you know at this level just given you only have to field 11 guys but realistically six at a time it makes it a lot easier for for countries that don't have as you know wide range of talent to be able to kind of compete at the highest level yeah you mentioned that and i'm thinking about these games we've had in the u21 championships in which a couple guys here and there maybe one on a team gets hurt and all of a sudden that team drops off a little bit dramatically because that's their guy. You know, he takes the face off. He goes down and stays in on offense, goes play defense. You lose yeah. him. You, you don't have the depth to be able to say, okay, next man up as maybe a, a Team USA or a Canada might in that situation. But like you said, well, from what you experienced, you could feel a little bit more of a level playing field because that's what, of course, the IOC looks for when they're considering these sports. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just looking at Japan taking home the bronze, I think that's the perfect yep. example of how this game is expanding and how this format can be, you know, the perfect way 
for, for us to kind of really expand the game into, into different countries, but also potentially the Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go talk about the PLL now. You've got um, your games in Seattle this upcoming weekend. Water Dogs are in the playoffs, went on that nice run, dropped one this past weekend. It kind of showed you against the Redwoods, you know, how competitive it is. Yeah, we know the Whip Snakes at the top, but it feels like you never really know, I guess, in what you've experienced here. It just matters who brings it on, on. You can't really take a week off, I guess, is what the example was for you guys. I'm sure this last weekend. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, the, the parody is incredible. And what I'd say is there there's even more guys that are sitting at home right now, not on a roster that could be competing and playing at this extremely high level. We could add two more teams and it, the parody wouldn't really drop off that much. So that there is no week where, you know, it's a clear win. It's a clear favorite. There's obviously, you know, weeks where you feel like you have a better matchup or, you know, generally you feel like you're the better team in certain situations, but there, there's no week where you're walking in there and, you know, just kind of not putting your best effort out there and still getting the win. It's competitive, you know, at every single level. And obviously like a team like the Redwoods, they're, they're good kind of throughout, but they also have some great specialty pieces to them like TD Earl and then, you know, Jack Kelly and cage like that. Those are differentiators. And if they really stand on their head, it, it's difficult for teams to kind of overcome that. You know, you've been able, like we talked about before we, we started here to kind of have this career, you know, professionally, and it, like you said a moment ago, some of these guys are, are on the sidelines here. They're, they're uh, you know, they've competed but unable to crack the roster. What's it take to be consistently in that lineup each week as a pro year after year? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the consistency factor is kind of the key word there. You, you got to want to show that you want it. I, I would say that you, you just have to put the effort in kind of week in, week out. And it's a difficult league to play. We're not practicing during the week. We're not getting our reps in. You know, you got to find any way you can to actually get to the highest level when you get there for practice on Thursday or Friday, whatever it may be. And being consistent is the, the biggest thing. In order to actually play, we only get, you know, 10 chances at it throughout the year. And then the playoffs, you, you got to be there. You got to show up. You got to have your A game every single time. And, you know, it's not it's not easy. You don't have the full week of practice to build up to it, to kind of build the trust with the coach. So just being able to kind of be ready on game day, it really comes up to the individual. So, you know, being able to find those reps. And for me, like I have a lot of, you know, friends and players in the PLL, like Jerry Connors that I work with throughout the week, mm -hmm. just so I can kind of try and get to that game shape by the time that I'm getting ready for practice. So that's kind of the biggest thing that I would say. Yeah, in interesting. I was going to ask you what you do over the course of a week to build up kind of on your own. What do you do in the off season to maintain that? Yeah, I mean, I I'd say it's a, it's a lot of the same. Mm -hmm. it it's trying to play in any playing lacrosse as much as I can, it whether that's, you know, potential like one-on-ones that I'm doing with Jared Connors or just generally getting out there. I'm really lucky where I have a field kind of across the street from me. So I just kind of grab my goal. I throw it out there and I, I can get reps in, you know, whenever I, whenever I feel and whenever I can get the open field. Um, but, you know, keeping in shape in terms of, you know, lung capacity and being able to run all day, I, I'd say that's just something that you just really need to just get out on the field and do sprints. And then, the lacrosse part, especially in New York City, is the hard part. That's really just finding a field. And what I find is having someone with you and having someone to motivate you and keep you accountable is the biggest thing that's helped me. Who wins those matchups more often than not? Between you and I'll say it's 50. <laughs> 50. That's a good answer. <laughs> that's an acceptable answer. All right. I got one more question for you. This was on your fun facts page on the PLL uh, site there. You ate Chipotle every day for three years in high school? Yeah, that, that, that's a fact. Um, <laughs> it, it got it got to the point where, you know, holidays, they'd be closed. So I would get two bowls the day before so I could have it that day as well. Yeah, I, I was fully addicted. I you know I was a part of the original farm team that they that they had where they had some swag associated with it. They've since disbanded that farm team. But you know, now they've got some swag and stuff that I uh, I try and get my hands on as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, was it the same order every day? You know, it's pretty consistent, but I'd say it's developed a little bit over time. You know, the addition of the the honey vinaigrette salad dressing is a, is a new addition that, you know, I welcomed over the last years. But, uh, but yeah, it's been pretty consistent. You know, a uh, bowl, a lot of rice, a lot of chicken. Yeah, I mean, it's not, not bad for you, which is a good thing, right? I mean, you're, you're, doing, you're putting yeah. the right stuff in your body at the end of the day. What's the frequency yeah. these days? You know, I'd say it's... Just given that I, I can't always drag my girlfriend to it, um, I'd say it's probably two to three times a week. Okay, well, you've, you've uh, leveled off. A little more moderation there. Uh, yeah, anything, exactly. anything you're looking forward to in, in Seattle here this weekend, uh, seeing any of the sites or even getting out there and playing? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard it's a really cool arena. Mm. Uh, you know, it's an indoor place, apparently. So I'm just super excited to get that last regular season game under our belt so we can get some momentum going into the, the playoffs. Absolutely. Ryan Conrad, as always, we appreciate the time, man. Safe travels and good luck this weekend. Yeah, thanks a lot. So we are now joined by Puerto Rico's Brandon Aviles and Colin Baez, who are getting ready to compete in these U21 World Championships in Ireland. Uh, guys, I know you're just getting settled in there as we're talking just before the tournament. What's the feel? I'll start with you, Brandon. What's the feel around this team and as you guys have gotten together, getting ready to tackle this thing? It's been awesome. A lot of great guys. And uh, I think the most important thing is everyone's super excited, especially to fly across the globe to be in Ireland to play. And not only that, like we've we went to Puerto Rico, we practiced there, and we went to we did a tournament too. So just now being halfway across across the globe with all the guys, it's pretty awesome. And uh, you know, just a great group of guys. That's all I can really say. It's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'll pay you bank off that. I mean, the guy, the connection we've already made off like not too long being together. I mean, these guys are awesome. I mean, we're playing for our island, and like, there's nothing better that you could do over the summer, you know. Yeah, Colin, I'll follow that up. Like, what does it mean to represent Puerto Rico in this tournament for you? I mean, it's it's huge. I mean, my dad was born in Puerto Rico, and um, his parents passed away. But if they were still alive, I mean, like all the other parents on the team and their grandparents like that are here just going crazy. It's such a big thing to be able to represent something that not a lot of guys can, you know. Many people know you as a short stick defensive midfielder at Syracuse, but I've seen the highlights from high school. Like, I know you can fill it up. What, what's the what's what do you feel like your role is on this team? I mean, honestly, just, you know, doing the dirty work. You know, I, I would say I'm a pretty gritty guy. So if they need me on defense, put my defense, obviously, in offense, I'll do it. Even face offs, like all good to call them, but hey, I'll do it all. So, uh, yeah, so it's been, uh, you know. It's been good for me, and you know, I, I for me like personally, it's nothing, nothing new. Just doing everything, and that's that's really you know what it comes down to. So from Team Sweden, we have Jonas Hunter as he gets ready for these U21 World Championships in Ireland. Jonas, for you, what's it mean for the opportunity to represent Sweden in this event? Yeah, I mean, it's a super special opportunity to represent Sweden. I mean, my mom's from here. I've got a lot of family, so. Uh, it means a lot to grow the game in uh, in Europe. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's really cool. For somebody who obviously played high school lacrosse uh, in the United States and plays now at the University of Vermont, how cool is it? I know you had a training camp in Sweden. How cool is it to take that experience and now be playing a sport with a bunch of guys that uh, some are from Sweden, some are like you, and trying to kind of integrate the cultures and all these different people from different backgrounds? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what our training camp was about, you know, just trying to build team chemistry. So, like you said, there's a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different people with lacrosse experience. Um, so it's been a lot of fun just trying to help guys out and, you know, grow the game in Sweden and, you know, just, you know, yeah. What, are, what is people's reaction when you show up to Sweden and you're like in uh, baggage claim, and you're pulling out lacrosse sticks? Uh, I mean, honestly, a lot of people ask us, like, what is this? You know, they, they really don't know what lacrosse is here, um, which is a little which is a little crazy. I mean, how, how it, it's got to be cool, though, to kind of like be leading the way and hopefully trying to develop the sport over there. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, this is the first U21 Sweden team um, that's been part that's going to participate in these world championships. So. Um, yeah, it's just a really cool opportunity to to hopefully like put Sweden on the map a little bit and just, you know, uh, get to get lacrosse some exposure out here. You mentioned getting to know some of your teammates. Like what was the most fun part or most interesting thing about learning some of the things about some of the, the guys you'll be going to battle with here over the next couple of weeks? Um, just <laughs> it's been a little bit of a of a battle because, I mean, we're, we're trying to speak Swedish with all the guys. So some guys are mostly Swedish. And then there's, you know, guys like me who speak little Swedish or none at all. So, you know, it's just been great kind of, um, you know, just sharing stories about our schools and about like where we're from. So just that. 
What, what kind of Swedish you got? You got like a favorite line or something you can give us? Um, I usually just go with, hey, my name is Jonas. How are you, dog? What is that? Just, just a little introduction, like, hey, I'm Jonas. Like, how are you doing? All right. There you go. Yeah. That, it, you know, it's the basics that gets you like to be when you go there and you're able to talk to people. It, it gets you done. Yeah, that's my go-to. <laughs> that's fair enough. Uh, you're from Oregon, and that's that's where you played your high school lacrosse. I wonder, it, there have been a lot of great lacrosse players who have come out of that state. Who were some of the guys that were from Oregon that you looked up to coming up through? I'd say I looked up to uh, Tucker Dordovic. I mean, I lived two minutes away from him, kind of grew up with him a little bit. So um, we've played a lot of lacrosse together. So it's really cool to watch him, you know, excel at the next level so he's someone i really look up to and try to emulate some of my game after uh, he's a he's a good guy and he's, he's certainly made some waves throughout his college lacrosse career uh getting ready to, to finish it up there at uh, at georgetown for you you're at vermont uh, you're coming off a, a nice season you, you've continued to kind of build throughout your career so far what do you hope this experience and this competition helps you do uh, helps get you ready for as you head back to vermont uh for another year yeah, I mean, I really just hope, like, you know, in the month of August, just getting to play a ton of lacrosse. Um, I hope it just prepares me, gets me ready, um, just gets me in game shape. And so, you know, I'm hoping to, you know, contribute a lot at Vermont this year. So I'm just looking forward to practicing and, you know, just getting better. And you got a bunch of your teammates representing different teams over there. You're going to have a chance to catch up with them. I know you just got there, but you're going to catch up to up with them while you're there. Yeah, for sure. I've been texting a couple of them already, so um, planning on meeting up with them, and I'm really excited to watch them play because a couple of them are on Canada, so watching that Canada-U.S. game tomorrow should be sweet. Catamounts well represented over there in Ireland uh, for these U21 World Championships. Jonas, we can't wait to see Sweden in action throughout this tournament as well. Good luck uh, and enjoy the experience. Certainly a once-in-a-lifetime kind of deal, so have, have fun with it. Definitely. Thank you so much. Of course, our comprehensive coverage of the U21 Men's World Championship will continue all week long here on LAC Sports Network right on through till Saturday when the medals are awarded and the places are decided. Of course, we know U.S., Canada at the top but as we heard from some of these players from Puerto Rico, they are primed for maybe making that next step, getting into that pool A in this tournament. So those spots, maybe not as secure for teams like Australia and England and even Haudenosaunee who haven't looked at their best at some times, those doors might be open for teams like Puerto Rico and Japan to find themselves in pool A the next time around and if they can get into that top five. Of course, the fifth place game key and that and some of these championship group games, which we'll have for you here on LAC Sports Network. So, yeah, we know Canada, the U.S. probably going to be at the top when it's all said and done. But you're going to want to watch these placement games to see where everybody fits. And if there's some changes here at the top, really interesting to see the steps that some countries have made to put themselves in the conversation. Watch out for Puerto Rico and Japan. A couple of teams you'll see right here on LSN. Our championship bracket coverage will start on Thursday. We'll have the platinum bracket the next couple days and then switch over to see where some of those teams fit in the championship bracket after that. It's going to be really exciting. A lot of great lacrosse still in store. We appreciate you joining us here for this edition of Lacrosse Now. Travis is going to be back a week from now. We'll be back on Tuesday to wrap up the PLL regular season. Maybe talk some Athletes Unlimited. Taylor Moreno, of course, winning it all over the course of this past weekend. We'll talk about all of that together and with you as time goes on. But that'll do it for this edition of Lacrosse Now. We'll see you next time.